The vaquita porpoise has been surviving for thousands of years in the upper Gulf of California, an area in northwestern Mexico which is only about an hour drive south of Arizona, but worlds away. Things really got bad in the 80s when the yellow croaker fisheries collapsed in China due to the illegal market for its swim bladder. This led to a run on the Mexican croaker known as the totuaba. Out came the gillnets to ensnare the species, also known as the cocaine of the seas, since its swim bladder could fetch tens of thousands of dollars in the black market. And with the gillnets clogging up the upper Gulf of California, Vaquita numbers began to nosedive. In 2014, the International Committee for the Recovery of the Vaquita issued a report, and they documented this incredible decline. This is Zach Smith. He's a director of biodiversity conservation at the Natural Resources Defense Council, or NRDC. And for the past nine years, he spearheaded the organization's efforts to protect the vaquita. NRDC had an incredible history of helping save the last nursing grounds of the gray whales in Laguna San Ignacio and had fought against Mitsubishi, who had plans to develop assault mining in that area. And so we knew some people in Mexico. I had some time and someone said, hey, do you want to look into this vaquita issue and see what we can do to help? Like many at the NRDC, Smith is also an attorney. NRDC's strategy is to use the courts to force governments to change their ways. It became clear pretty soon we would have to turn up the pressure on Mexico to really compel action. I'm Ruxandra Guidi, and this is The Catch, a series from Foreign Policy, This season, we've come to the upper Gulf of California, where illegal fishing is threatening the life of the vaquita, the world's smallest porpoise, and the lives of many traditional and artisanal fishers. Today, episode three, The Embargo. We'll talk about the efforts made by the NRDC and others to compel Mexico to follow its own laws to protect the vaquita. We'll see firsthand the consequences of these actions on local fishers and the market for the highly desirable blue shrimp. Let's get back on the ground in Mexico, where for a week I toured the upper Gulf of California alongside journalist Ernesto Mendez and marine biologist Alex Oliveira. On this day, our mission is to get a better understanding of the global pressures to save the vaquita. <laughs> It's Sunday at 10 o'clock in the morning. It's the day of the World Cup final in Qatar. France and Argentina are playing. Alex, Ernesto, and I came to San Felipe, a fishing community in the state of Baja California, where many American tourists also arrive this time of year, especially the so-called snowbirds, retirees who come south, escaping the cold winter months. We have some free time before heading out to sea to do more interviews, And it occurs to me that few fishers must be out today because the wind is strong once again. And, you know, it's the day of the World Cup final. So we're drinking coffee, watching the game on a big screen. We're getting ready to pay the server when... Argentina wins. And so begins our day of work with a Latin American victory. We walk out of the restaurant, and Ernesto and I get closer to the sea. I realize I was wrong. Fishers did go out today, as they go out every day of the year. Fishers don't really get days off. We can see six or seven trailers parked there in the sand next to the sea. They belong to the owners of the pangas, those small motorboats that dominate the docks and are now out to sea. When they get back from fishing, they'll use the trailers to tow their pangas home. Ernesto tells me that this is an illegal pier. Because no one is here to ask you for your documents before leaving. The other main pier, the legal one, is at the other end of this coastline. So Ernesto, Alex and I get back in the car to go see how things work over there. Ernesto points out that on the legal pier, the official one, there are a lot fewer shrimp boats. 
entonces es que son muy poquitos a comparación de Peñasco, ¿no? We're looking for parking when Ernesto gets a call from a fisherman who will be taking us out to sea today. This whole area is deserted. We don't see anyone. Not even the Mexican Navy is here. There are no inspectors from the National Aquaculture and Fisheries Commission, known as CONAPESCA, and neither are there inspectors from PROFEPA, the Federal Attorney for Environmental Protection. All of them should be present at this dock, requesting documents from fishers 365 days a year, because again, fishers work around the clock. I'm looking around and everything is so quiet. But a little over two years ago, this was the site of a big showdown between fishers, the conservation NGO Sea Shepherd, and the Mexican government. Nero! Nero! On December 31st, 2020, Minutes after a panga collided with the Sea Shepherd ship, the Farley Moat, dozens of fishers approached this pier where the Profepa and Navy facilities are located. They were protesting the death of the fisherman Mario Garcia Toledo, nicknamed El Guero Coyote, who died after his panga crashed into the Farley Moat. The mob demanded that Sea Shepherd be kicked out of the country. Many felt that panga collision hadn't been an accident. They resented that these foreign activists did not let them do their fishing, and they were also seeking justice for their friend's death, or at least some sort of response from the Mexican government. The fishers of the upper Gulf of California have had no viable fishing alternatives or support from the Mexican government. Before current President Andrés Manuel López Obrador got into office, there had been about 22 subsidy and training programs in place, helping fishers pay for their gear, gas, and other expenses, including the cost of keeping their licenses up to date. The government also made payments to people up and down the supply chain, from the owner of the fishing vessel to the worker packing in the processing plant, everything to prevent illegal fishing in the vaquita habitat. The subsidy was known as the Compensation for the Protection of the Vaquita. But once in office, López Obrador ordered cuts to that budget, leaving fishers with a subsidy of 7,200 pesos a year, about $360, that's all. Ernesto and Alex tell me that the government has simply abandoned these fishing communities. Today, there's no effective monitoring of fishing. There has been little investment in alternative fishing methods and scant awareness campaigns to prevent illegal fishing. Alex says, El tema aquí en es la The issue here in Mexico is impunity. So when you don't enforce the laws, impunity leads you to anarchy, and that's what's happening. Whenever there have been violent confrontations with fishers, government agencies have been instructed to simply withdraw, to not fire bullets, but rather to give hugs. Abrazos, no balazos. Abrazos, no balazos, as López Obrador says. Conservationists like my travel partner, Alex Oliveira, say this isn't even a strategy. It's more like surrender. To begin with, Alex says, the laws would have to be enforced in these communities. And then you could look for options, offering fishing gear that can be sustainable. But everything must start from applying the rule of law. Because it can't be a place where the strongest rules, the one with the most weapons, right? First should come the law, and then dialogue. In San Felipe and Santa Clara, here in the upper Gulf of California, the ones in charge today are the tough guys, the Fisher Federations the illegal fishers, and even organized crime cartels. We will get into all that in our next episode. It's a mess. And everyone we talk to says it's been created by the lack of a real government. I spoke to one government official from an agency that's in charge of environmental protection, kind of like the Mexican EPA. We're altering his voice here since he was not authorized to speak to us in fierce reprisals. Visto. Envuelta. En muchos dilemas. We've been involved in many dilemmas, he says. And without a budget, without vans, without accredited personnel as inspectors, we cannot perform our functions and carry out this work. 
we do not have inspectors working 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. There are only inspectors in the port of San Felipe and three in Puerto Peñasco. Like other government agencies that used to observe, monitor, and enforce fishing in Mexico, his agency suffers from a lack of funds and of leadership. This official told us that for four years now, his agency has been in the hands of someone chosen by López Obrador who has no experience in environmental issues. The first thing she did, he said, was start laying off experienced people with a lot of knowledge and priority issues, the main one being the protection of the vaquita. The vaquita and the real possibility that it will disappear continues to alarm environmentalists and activists around the world. Zach Smith, the lawyer from the NRDC, is part of a consortium that's been monitoring the situation, including Alex Oliveira from the Center for Biological Diversity and others. We have a call every week in which we continue to try to find ways in which we can apply pressures on Mexico to save the vaquita. And so that group of people, yes, we, we brought the lawsuit. The lawsuit looked at the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which bans the import of fish and fish products that are caught in a manner that doesn't follow U.S. standards for marine mammal protection. And clearly, the fishing activities that are taking place in the upper Gulf of California are not meeting U.S. standards for the conservation of the vaquita. Considering that the use of gill nets in that area to catch any kind of fish for export to the U.S. threatens the very survival of the species, and so other gear would have to be used. And until then, no exports using gill nets could come in. So these environmental NGOs brought a lawsuit under the Marine Mammal Protection Act to the Court of International Trade, a U.S. court that deals with issues that could result in an embargo. The court moved fairly quickly and in 2018 ordered the National Marine Fishery Service to ban imports of shrimp and other seafood caught with gill nets from the upper Gulf of Mexico. But that 2018 ban wasn't really working. And then the U.S. instituted a much wider ban against all fish and fish products that are caught with gill nets from that region. In response to that, in 2020, the Mexican government issued regulations that are actually quite good on paper. They ban gill nets to be used on the water in the entire region. Um, They actually ban the possession of gill nets, and they require fishermen to turn over their gill nets. There were other parts of this regulation that made the zero-tolerance area a place where you couldn't have boats at all, boats that had to have vessel monitoring systems in place. There were limitations on the movement of vessels um, during the day, and there was disembarkation points where you could only leave to go fishing and come back from fishing in certain areas so that uh, inspectors could uh, see what um, you had been catching. All of this uh, on paper was was great, and if fully implemented and enforced, would make a real difference. And unfortunately, this is just a regulation on paper, and it has to be implemented and enforced. And that is the place where we are now, where Mexico hasn't taken those additional steps. There's a lot on the line here, both for the vaquita and for the fishing industry in the Gulf of California. It's estimated that legal fishing brings in profits of up to $260 million a year and accounts for tens of thousands of jobs. So to make a wholesale change would require a big investment to help transition away from gill nets. It's not impossible to do this, says Zach Smith. U.S. fishers comply with much tighter restrictions. Mexican fishers are clearly at an economic disadvantage, But somehow, everyone should work towards creating a sustainable global market. We want U.S. consumers to feel comfortable that the seafood that they consume meets U.S. standards, no matter where it comes from, for marine mammal protection. And we don't want American fishermen to be at an unfair advantage. They're taking the extra step to use better practices. They're closing down fisheries when there's a problem with marine mammals. They're transitioning to other gear at great expense. And why should we be doing that and not require other countries that export to the United States? It's just an issue of fairness for U.S. fishermen. While the Mexican government agrees to these principles, its actions tell a different story. 
fishers here are not given fishing gear or viable alternatives to earn a living. So illegal fishing persists. After visiting San Felipe's legal pier, we board a panga, trying to find others who may be out looking for shrimp. It's easy to tell the shrimpers apart. They're typically anchored in one place, while a couple of fishers drop the net, wait for it to catch shrimp, and then lift the heavy net full of shrimp on board. Now remember, since the 2018 U.S. embargo and its 2020 expansion, all gillnet fishing here is illegal. Never mind what they're out to catch. We're very close to the zero tolerance zone, the area in the top left corner of the upper Gulf of California that's been designated as a vaquita refuge. No transit or fishing is allowed in the zero tolerance zone. We're skirting the buoys that warn fishers to keep out. And then we see a panga. It doesn't have a name. That usually means they don't even have their licenses. So they're fishing illegally. But that doesn't stop them from talking to us. There are two of them on board. They look young, in their 20s or 30s. They're wearing the typical yellow jumpsuits that fishers out here wear. They say they've been at sea for a couple of hours, but they have only caught a couple of shrimp. Literally, two shrimp. They tell us they spent 4,000 pesos, about $200, in gas for their panga. But they're not too worried. They still have the rest of the day to catch shrimp. And they say they don't care about the embargo against blue shrimp from the upper gulf because what there is plenty of these days is buyers. One of them says, I don't know where the shrimp ends up, but even though there is an embargo, buyers haven't gone away. The older fisher tells us that he's been fishing since he was a small boy, and he has a side gig repairing pangas. But business has been good. In the upper gulf, he says, fishers have seen a demand for totuaba and blue shrimp growing a lot in recent years. He also tells us he's not a fan of Sea Shepherd or other environmental organizations because they're cutting into his profits. And what's more, both he and his fishing partner say they were at the protests two years ago in the pier in San Felipe, where the Mexican Navy and another government agency were set on fire. One of the guys seems to realize they're oversharing, and they cut our conversation short. He tells us they're going to raise their net and go elsewhere to fish. So we say goodbye, and we turn around, too, towards the San Felipe Pier. Running into these fishers, you realize they're in a tough spot. While many are aware of how destructive gillnets could be, they know that as long as there's a buyer, they will continue catching and selling shrimp to make a living. That excuse doesn't fly for everyone, even if most fishers in the upper gulf don't often have other means to make a living. There are people down here who follow the vaquita situation closely, and they're quick to blame the fishers for its disappearance. From my point of view, a fisheries expert tells us, the main people responsible for this are the fishermen. The poor, innocent, victimized fishermen does not exist. They cost all this, and they're doing it. Nobody but them. We meet this expert in a cafe, we won't use his name for security reasons, and we're also altering his voice. It's not safe to speak out. Here in the Upper Gulf, everyone is taking sides, and it's easy to blame the fishers. But some say they're just an easy scapegoat for a broken supply chain. The fisheries expert says that since the U.S. embargo went into effect in 2018, illegal fishing hasn't gone down. Quite the opposite. It's booming. Sí, la, la pesca, la pesca de... The small-scale shrimp fishery in the Upper Gulf, currently in terms of scale and of production, is at pre-2015 levels, he says. I ask him, so even worse than before the embargo? Oh yeah, for sure, he says. His claims are based on records kept by the Mexican government itself from Conapesca, 
the National Aquaculture and Fisheries Commission, which show that shrimp yields are higher than they were before there were fishing restrictions in the upper Gulf. Two years ago, those yields broke records. It's almost as if the more obstacles and restrictions, the more illegal fishing has grown. Alex Ernesto and I want to know why the U.S. embargo is not working. If illegal fishers like the ones we just met continue dropping their gill nets and selling their shrimp despite the embargo, who's buying that shrimp? The fisheries expert tells me, the only market that can absorb that can generate some revenue at those prices is the U.S. market. There's concrete evidence that this product is in the U.S., no doubt. In other words, the pipeline is still completely open. Blue shrimp from the upper Gulf is freely flowing into U.S. markets, even though it's banned. The embargo is clearly not working. Instead, it's generated a black market, a fertile ground for organized crime. Next time on The Catch, the government is absent and cartels get enmeshed, luring fishers into illegality. And that's it for part three of our new season of The Catch. Support for this podcast comes from foreign policy readers and also in part from the Walton Family Foundation. Our production team includes Rosie Julen, Rob Sachs, Maria Jimena Aragon, and Jimena Letgar. Special thanks to our team in Mexico, Alex Oliveira and Ernesto Mendez. If you like what you're hearing, please consider leaving a review and subscribe on Apple or wherever you get your podcasts or head over to foreignpolicy.com, where you can listen to our other podcasts and sign up for our newsletter. Thanks for listening. I'm Ruxandra Guidi. See you next week. Thank you.